This is guanciale. This is what it looks like. You see that beautiful fat from the jowls. This is cured. He's talking about guanciale with so much passion. Bravo. I mean, this Food Network is really doing very well lately. First with N. Burrell, Bolognese sauce. Now with this guy. Bucatini is the pasta. Bucatini. Oh, that guy speaks. This guy's been in Italy many times. Bucatini. It was my grandmother's favorite pasta. I'm not gonna argue with my grandmother. No way, no way. I can't argue with you. You. Just not gonna happen. Do you trust Food Network? Hmm. Today we are reacting to Food Network Amatriciana sauce. Let's see if they know how to make it. And we're gonna make pasta matriciana. One of the pasta alla matriciana, okay? No pasta matriciana, pasta a matriciana, if you don't want to add the al, alla matriciana. The classic Rome dishes, you're gonna take a trip to Rome, you're gonna save a lot of money by doing this at home for all your friends. They're ah, can you speak? Bravo, bravo, bravo. Let's get it done, here we go. I'm confident, this guy's gonna be good, he knows, he knows that he's gonna take you to Rome and he's romantic, bravo. Before you start any of this process, get a pot of water on the fire and bring it to a boil. Bravo, so he knows that you need to boil the pasta. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do with this matriciana is... Ah, matriciana. We are gonna identify the proper ingredients. There's a, such a simplicity to this dish. One of the great things about all things Roman is the quality of ingredients. Well, mostly Italian cuisine or Mediterranean cuisine, ingredients, freshness. Fresh fish, fresh fowl, fresh fruit. I buy it, mm -hmm, I eat it. <laughs> the, the cheeses and the beautiful guanciale. Guan hmm, that's guanciale. He said it very well, guanciale. I think he cut it very thin, but at least he's using guanciale. Chale are the jowls of a pig that that are cured. It is one of the most sought after, most beautiful ingredients in all things Italian, as far as I'm concerned. Bravo, bravo, this guy, he knows guanciale, he's been to Rome, he's gonna cook well, I believe. I'm very confident about this guy. This is guanciale, this is what it looks like. You see that beautiful fat from the jowls, this is cured. He's talking about guanciale with so much passion, bravo. In aged, it smells the way I would assume heaven smells. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> we have it sliced very thin here. You can get this in most specialty stores. You could definitely get it. I think you can find guanciale everywhere now because everybody loves to make carbonara or dishes like this. And guanciale, it's such a special, beautiful ingredient. I like it more than bacon. We have some strained tomatoes. These are just... What strained tomatoes? What does it mean? Now, if you notice, it's not in a can. This is in a, in a container and this is really also easy to find. It's like a passata, you mean? Is that what it is? The reason why I prefer this is because it doesn't have the same citric acid content uh, that a lot of canned ingredients have. Yeah, he's right, he's right. The can has acidity regulator normally. So, well done, I like him. I like to use peeled tomatoes, to be honest, because, I don't know, I think it'd be fresher. I like to squeeze the tomatoes, but it is no right or wrong. I like this because a lot of people say, well, when you make tomato sauce, you have to add sugar to counteract the acidity. That acidity in tomato, in a canned tomato, comes from the citric acid. He knows, man. He doesn't use sugar in tomatoes. I love it. I mean, this Food Network is really doing very well lately. First with N. Burrell Bolognese sauce. Now with this guy. Oh my God! Wow! If you're omitting that canned tomato citric acid, you don't have to add sugar to anything. Bravo, but the thing is, the tomato needs to be good, yes. When you make the sofrito, you add the carrots, they bring sweetness to your sauce as well, okay? So yes, the quality of tomato is good, but you need the carrots and the onion in the sofrito and the celery. I personally like to blend my sofrito. I blend it, it turns into a cream, then I cook the sofrito, and then it basically, uh, uh, it disappears in the sauce and it gives, the carrots give the beautiful sweetness to the sauce. Check out my tomato sauce pasta video, you will love it. I am not a big fan of the citric acid content of those tomatoes, so I try to stay away from it whenever. Bravo, bravo, very, very passionate, very passionate. Bucatini is the pasta, bucatini. 
is a very- Oh, that guy speaks. This guy's been in Italy many times. Bucatini. A thick pasta, but it has a hole running through the center. So it's an extruded pasta. Is buco means a hole, so bucatini. Bravo, so it's got the beautiful hole in there that you want the sauce to go through it. It was my grandmother's favorite pasta. I'm not gonna argue with my grandmother. No way, no way. I can't argue with you. You. Just not gonna happen. So first thing we're gonna do is start with a pot like this, a very, very, very low flame. What is he doing there? Hmm, that's uh, interesting. I want to render this guanciale. I'm even in there, in a small pot. I'm gonna do like as low as possible, half off the fire. So if you notice, there's the pot is only getting half of that small flame. This is interesting, okay. We have this sliced very thin. What I like to do with this guanciale is to cut it in about a one inch I normally like to cut into strips, so I taste it. It's nice and crunchy. When I make carbonara, I like to have it that way. Me personally, and many other people I know. This way, I don't think I get the crunch. I don't get that same experience, but everyone is different. It's like when you make spaghetti agli olio. Some people like to slice the garlic. I like to crush it. It doesn't have to be exact, but I cut it like that because it's gonna cook down. It's gonna have this amazing texture and the key to this guanciale. You slice it like prosciutto. I'm not a fan of this, sorry. Make sure I cut it all the way through. As I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. You want it as uniform as possible. I'm and with guanciale, you don't need extra virgin olive oil because the guanciale releases the fat. The fat melts and turns into oil. I'm gonna start with a little bit of olive oil in Extra virgin olive oil, don't say olive oil. Now the cook time of this, once you add this guanciale to the pan, what's gonna happen is you're gonna let it go nice and slow. You wanna render out the fat, but you don't wanna get any color on this guanciale because I just love the way it is. Okay, so you wanna use guanciale as a prosciutto and um, gently cook it, all right? But I will do that in the same pan where you do the sauce, but anyway. So what we're looking for with this guanciale as it's cooking inside this pot is we want all the fat to be rendered out and then it's cooking inside its own fat and it's crisping up, but it's never turning brown. It has a nice blondish color to it. And all I really, really love a matrigiana. I really, really love it. All that residual fat is cooked out. We'll then strain or drain out that fat, keep the guanciale that's crispy on top of a paper towel and we could even utilize some of that guanciale fat in different various places. If I like how it explains, I mean Food Network is really doing well lately, bravo. Really low flame, it's going to take about 20 minutes or so. Wow, 20 minutes, okay. Well you cut it so thin, I normally say five to seven minutes and your guanciale strips are done, but okay. I have this guanciale, it is cooked down, the fat is rendered, it has a nice blondish color to it. Yeah, it looks nice, it looks very nice. It looks, it looks like a, a cooked prosciutto, it's, it's nice. Crisping up nicely, you could smell how delicious this is. I mean, these are the things that would get me really excited. And That's what takes you to Rome. That smell takes you all the way to Rome, just like that. The things that I love about really good Italian cooking, because it is all about these beautiful ingredients, about making them shine, right? So good. I like the way he speaks. So we have that guanciale inside here. What I, what I think I'm going to do is just get a little bit of paper towel and take the guanciale out of the pot and just put it on this paper towel. To be honest, this paper towel business, um, I know Antonio Carluccio did it too. It's a funny dish. <laughs> what are you trying to do by using um, kitchen paper? Don't do much. Keep the fat inside the pot. And then what I may do is utilize some of this fat in the actual sauce. So bravo, bravo. So the guanciale is here. You can see how it's nice and blonde. It's not browned, right? We don't want to change the flavor of the guanciale, but instead we want to render it out. So what I'll do here, really low fire. Um, first things first, I'm going to get a piece of garlic. Of course, Americans always have to use garlic. Always. Why? Why? You don't have to put onion. You don't need to put garlic in a matrigiana, okay? You can just 
have a plain, but of course you can put garlic, of course you can put onion if that's what you want. Um, up to you. I'm just gonna crush it. And I'm gonna add a little bit of this guanciale fat. Nice, 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 nice. <laughs> Nice. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. I'm gonna add this one clove of garlic. All right, he's doing this Italian way. It gives the flavor to the oil and then it's gonna remove the garlic. Hmm. While the garlic is cooking inside this fat and kind of rendering that flavor, intermingling these flavors, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell how excited this gets. I just- You're very excited. I like you, Scott. I was very worried about this recipe. I said, oh, something bad is about to happen, but wow. Well done! Well done! Love this stuff. You smell the olive oil and the garlic and that guanciale fat. It is just absolute heaven. It's my favorite thing about Italian food. We understand that, Scott. It's enough now, okay? Come on, cook for us. These beautiful little flavors that are so powerful, how they intermingle together and they just create this perfect little dance. <laughs> I love it. All right. In the meantime, about half a pound of pasta. Aspetta, aspetta, you haven't done the sauce yet. What happened to the sauce? To the sauce, and the pasta should be cooked, boiled, when the sauce is ready. But first, before we add the pasta in the water, we want this pasta to taste like broth. So I add enough salt. God, is very generous. So the pasta cooking liquid tastes like broth. And what I mean by that is it's neutral in flavor. You don't have to taste it. Normally I put a generous tablespoon of rock salt or sea salt in my pasta water. It does a great job. You wanna put more, you put more. Less, less. But if you taste it, what's the point? <laughs> so it's boiling water, you don't wanna taste it. Not too much, not too little. I'm gonna add a touch more. Oh my God. I feel like I'm watching my nonna. Now, we're gonna add about eight ounces of pasta to the water. That's about two portions, give or take, maybe a little Heavy two portions. Heavy? I eat it by myself. But you'll be happy it's there. This bucatini we're gonna add to the salted pasta water. We... My worry is the sauce. The sauce needs at least 20 minutes to cook. Just wanna submerge this pasta under the water. Now, this is a very, very simple dish, right? Yeah, but come on, you talk too much. <laughs> so like me. Very simple. What I'm gonna do here now is that a little bit of this strained tomato. It's very fresh, it's beautiful. I never use the word strained tomatoes. What does it mean strained tomatoes? It must be passata, like tomato puree. You're just getting confused. I finally learned a new word and now you confuse me more with this new word again. Passata, is it passata? Gonna add a little bit to the pan. Come on, add more, be more generous. Come on, Food Network pay for it. Put more in there. There's about four ounces there, that's what we want. And also, while the pasta's cooking, I'm gonna add a little bit of the, the pasta water. Yeah, okay, but the thing is with the pasta water, Scott, let the pasta boil, okay? You take the pasta water from the pot about a minute or two minutes before the pasta is ready. The pasta, you just put the pasta in. Capito? You need to wait a little bit longer. The water, you know, the pasta needs to release the starch and uh, the amid, whatever it's called, and, and that's when you can use the pasta water. Right now, it's like using uh, tap water. It's really about the pasta that's being cooked in and the starch content that's cooking out of the pasta into the water. So it is really nicely flavored. We don't want to over salt it because as we use it in the sauce, we don't want it to be overly salty. Well, no, because uh, this dish deserves pecorino romano, which is salty. The guanciale is salty. You want to put some salt in the sauce, nice Scott? So, because that's going to reduce down, and of course, as it reduces, the flavor concentrates. I have to say, to be honest, for me, the sauce is way too runny, way too watery. I'm sorry to say. That's why I say I like to use, uh, yeah, I like to use peeled tomatoes. I see the tomatoes and it's crushed and thicker. I, I want my sauce to be thicker. You know, like that's how you can tell if a sauce is good or bad. This is too watery. I'm sorry, Scott. Everything was done well, but not the sauce. I'm also gonna add a pinch of crushed red pepper. It's okay, yeah, it's good. Again, it doesn't get more simple than this. 
That's why I love it so much, because you're taking a trip to Rome right here. The third time you say it. Okay, Scott, <laughs> you're taking me to Rome. This is why people go to Rome, to eat this pasta. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So the pasta takes about 10 minutes or so to cook. We are going to cook it about 80% of the way in the boiling salted water, and then we're gonna put it in this sauce. And again, it's gonna cook together, it's gonna intermingle, it's gonna... All right, that's why you want the water in the sauce. Okay, but still, I like my sauce to be thicker. What I wanna do is while that's cooking, I wanna remove the garlic. This is so Italian, Americans don't do that. This is so Italian to put a garlic in there and take it off. Americans will leave the garlic in there. So he has spent lots of time in Italy or he's been watching Italian cooking shows because that's what Italians do. I removed that garlic. We don't need it anymore. The flavor's in there. It's all good. Exactly what the Italians say. I'm gonna add a pinch of salt to this. Yeah, he didn't put any salt, so it, it is missing. All right, pasta is cooking, the bucatini. We're gonna add this momentarily. I can tell that this needs about five more minutes or so just by the way it's falling. Yeah, yeah, you can tell, you can tell. Look how stiff it is. So you can see that it's still, when it gets to this point, when it's almost done, it's gonna, it's gonna well, it won't break. When it, when it falls like this, you can tell that it needs a little bit more time and you can tell by the color as well. So this is a pasta. Pasta di Gragnano. Gragnano is a town. This guy knows how to speak very well. Town outside of Naples, which is known for its, for its uh, quality pasta. They My God, well done, Scott. Are you Italian, Scott? Actually, they have a pasta festival every year where they have in the street these pasta drying outside. It's an absolute yeah, He's selling to me. He's selling Italy to me. I'm Italian, but he's selling it to me. I want to go now. So what we're going to do with this pasta is it's almost done. I have a, a measuring cup here. I wanna reserve some of this pasta cooking liquid. Okay, bravo, that's very important now, yeah. I'm gonna pour that into the, I'm gonna save that, reserve that on the side. And the rest of it, I'm gonna put in a colander. Get a little bit of a facial. <laughs> Shut that flame off. Add this pasta directly to the tomato sauce. And I'm gonna let this cook. No, I like the way it toasts. I like the way it presents. Beautiful. You see how that looks? Thing of beauty. Perfect texture. You hear that sound? It's the right amount of sauce. All inside there. I'm gonna turn up this heat a little bit so it cooks a little quicker. Kind of... Well, you also have uh, a watery sauce. I'm sorry to say, Scott. Everything is done brilliantly, but that sauce is just not right for a matriciana. I'm sorry. I need something thick for a matriciana. I'm gonna finish this with cheese over the top of it. While that's cooking, I'm going to take half of that guanciale and mix it in. Bravo, yeah, because you want some to be in, in there and some at the end. Just to support that beautiful flavor of the tomato sauce. Because what's going to happen with this guanciale now, the one he added, it's going to get a little bit softer. It's gonna, not going to be that crunchy because it's been mixed with the sauce. And what he adds later will be crunchy. But that's a portion for one person, let me tell you. I eat the whole thing. I eat it. See, the pasta is absorbing all the uh, runny, watery sauce. It, the importance of mixing your pasta with the sauce, always, always. So many people don't know about it, like Gordon Ramsay, like so many chefs don't mix the pasta with the sauce. And then you end up having a, pa a dead pasta in the plate with the sauce on top, and that's completely wrong. This is what you need to do. This is how you give flavors to the pasta. While that's cooking, I'm gonna add a little bit of that pasta water, just a touch. We'll see if it's needed, I don't know. I mean, the sauce was already watery. I like the pan, I really like the, the pan. With a little bit of pecorino cheese momentarily. I would say this is probably for two people, but I will admit that I can easily eat this all by myself. <laughs> Finally, you said it, bravo. He didn't use enough, my friend. It's not enough. So you see the way this is coming together. There's not too much sauce, right? It's just enough sauce to coat the pasta, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Perfect to grab that piece of bread and sop up what's on the plate. 
one of my favorite things to do. There we go. Yeah, we love doing that. Cleaning the, the plate with the bread. Oh. So I'm gonna shut the heat off. Once you start to add cheese, it should see no more fire, right? Yeah, because if you do that, if you add the cheese on the fire, it becomes stringy and that's not good. It's a very good, bad sign of poor cooking skills or like not done right when you see the strings. Unless it's a lasagna or pasta forno, you know, baked pasta, that's different. So I have pecorino, pecorino cheese here. Pecorino Romano. Don't confuse pecorino from Sardinia, from Abruzzo or other regions of Italy. Way too salty. The pecorino Romano can also be salty, but we don't want to have a pecorino romano that is too salty, not something aged too, too old. Something young and fresh would be nice. Put it over the top of this pasta. It's good putting a lot, which is nice. You could, you could toss it together and let it all absorb, or you could just go right onto the plate from here. Nah, you have to mix it, mix it, mix it together. Look, you've done a good job, you've done a good job. What I would say, I'll say it soon, let's keep watching. We'll just go right onto the plate. Nothing wrong with that. A little bit of that residual liquid uh, sauce on the side just to top the pasta off. That's a small plate, by the way. There we go. And then this beautiful guanciale on top of that. How do you Go and watch my latest Amatriciana recipe. I did add an ingredient huh, that the books don't say you have to add. I didn't kill the pasta, I didn't destroy the recipe, I just added a little bit more of something. You go and check it out. What is missing here, it's one thing that is missing, is the love. I can, f I can feel passionate love when you speak, Scott, but I want the ingredients to make love together, okay? So I want them to feel each other, and I don't feel like they felt each other. I don't feel like they felt each other. I feel like the tomato was just put in there and with the water and, and the guanciale didn't make a lot with them and I, I don't know, I don't know, there was something weird about it but everything else, everything was good what you did, everything was good. You've done a, a good recipe, a very good amatriciana recipe. What I mean is, I think there is that, that love moment that needs to happen in the fry pan and it's missing a little bit. But, but again, I'm not, not saying anything wrong to Scott or what he did, he did a good job. It's just, I want to see more love when we cook Italian food. <laughs> yeah, guys, the pressure is on, I know, I know. What do you think of this? Is a matriciana one of your favorite? Uh, what is your favorite Roman pasta? Carbonara, a matriciana, cacio e pepe, or gricia, or zozzona? Which one do you like? Please go and watch my a matriciana video because, honestly, I think my latest a matriciana video is by far the top best, the next level a Madrigiana recipe you can find. Oh, let me tell you, and I'm not kidding, it's true, it's so good. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I will see you in the next Vincenzo's Plate Video Recipe. E ora si mangia. A good Madrigiana.